ES Audio. From the Evening Standard in London, I'm Mark Blunden and this is The Leader. 10,000 nurses are on strike and soon they'll be joined by legions of paramedics in a pay row. It comes as hundreds of soldiers costing thousands each a week who are meant as emergency stand-ins for ambulance crews. So they're being stopped from carrying out treatment or using 999 blue lights. The government says it puts patient safety first. But what if you're planning that rock climbing or base jumping trip? There will be disruption to service and it, it is important that we, you know, where people are planning any risky activity, I would strongly encourage them uh, not, to, uh, not to, to do so because there will be disruption on the day. That's Health Minister Will Quint on BBC Breakfast. The Royal College of Nursing is calling for a 19.2% pay rise, but the government's agreed to about a quarter of that, and PM Rishi Sunak's ruling out new talks. We've got 1.245 million people on the Agenda for Change contract. You can't just single out nurses and give them a, a pay rise over and above all the others who work within the NHS, the porters, the cleaners, the physiotherapists, the, 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 the junior managers, etc., who support the running uh, of the NHS. Let's cross to the pickets line at a central London hospital where we're joined by A&E nurse Amira who paints for us a picture of how bad the situation currently is with patient overload and short staffing. In the emergency department which is where I work I'm not able to meet the target of giving a patient their pain relief within a certain amount of time like we aim within 15 to 30 minutes. Now there are queues where patients self-present to A&E and they're going out of the door down onto the roads through to the bus stop sometimes in a lot of A&Es through the UK but also there are patients that are waiting in the back of ambulances again down the ramps and sometimes onto the road and they're waiting in corridors as well to offload. We're not able to help relieve their pain, but also we're not able to give them the treatment. Like, for example, if they have an infection and it's quite severe, they may need antibiotics within the hour. Patients are feeling the stress themselves. Like, they aren't oblivious as to what is going on around them, that people are uh, walking, running, trying to get here. They're apologising for not um, being there sooner. I I apologise at least. I don't know, a hundred times a day. And we asked Amira about her work in the intensive care unit and accident and emergency department, which is often dealing with the fallout from the capital's violent crime. There was a massive car that came up from the other side of the ambulance ramp and they threw out this man who was then on the floor and he was just bleeding. So I quickly grabbed some gloves. I was just by the entrance anyway. And I got some gauze and I quickly ran and I jumped on him to find the source of the bleeding. And he was actually bleeding through his femoral artery. So if I hadn't been there as soon as possible, he could have bled out and he could have died. But then I had some more help coming through because you quickly scream, help someone get a trolley and then you come out. But I mean, there's all sorts of emergencies that come through. There's also women having babies in the back of that, in the back of the cars that come to the ambulance ramp, which um, is very different. But I mean, I have delivered babies in very awkward situations as well. And Amira, could you describe what it was like working during COVID? That wasn't easy. I remember one that I actually fainted because it was so hot wearing two aprons, long sleeve aprons, uh, three pairs of gloves, and you're wearing a mask, but also an FFP3. You're wearing goggles. Um, you know, you're covering your hair, you're covering your feet. It's hot. There's not much um, like AC going through. There's a lot of people there. You're running around trying to get medication or uh, trying to help someone else who is who needs your help because there's an emergency or you're performing CPR. And to do that in layers and layers of clothing is not easy. And imagine you're wearing a, a, an FFP3, which is totally sealed around your mouth like for 12 and a half hours and actually more because you're not necessarily leaving work on time you're having to come in early and leaving late and sometimes you're not actually even being you're not able to use a toilet you're not able to get a glass of water it was very very difficult for a lot of clinicians for a lot of nurses to actually get a little bit of respite during their shift and if they were to it wasn't just okay I'm off to get some water you need to hand over for all your eight patients to a nurse who's also looking after eight patients and these are people who are on a ventilator that you need eyes on because they could be lifting up their hands and taking the tube out of their mouth because they might not necessarily be 
um, they might be waking up from their sedation that needs topping up on, or they might not be completely paralyzed and that needs topping up as well, but you're busy giving uh, emergency antibiotics to someone else or someone else is waking up and then you're trying to attend to them. Uh, so it was very, very dangerous. Let's go to the ads coming up. More from Amira and Standard Health reporter Daniel Keane shares the latest on paramedics joining nurses on the picket line. Why not hit rate and follow in the meantime? Amira, what would you say is the pitch for this big raise? Nurses are asking for 5% uh, above inflation pay rise, and that is because for about 10 years, we've lost a third of our pay since 2010. And the government have given and awarded themselves a pay rise nine times over, with one of them being the year of the pandemic in 2020. And now with the cost of living crisis and rise of inflation and energy bills, nurses are really struggling to make ends meet to pay for their energy bills. They could be having the winter flu or COVID themselves, but not able to heat their houses. And this is the same even with patients as well who are struggling. But also nurses aren't able to provide food for their families for their young children. And so what's happening to their NHS careers? They're going to the private sector in the UK where they have better benefits, that they're able to have a better quality of life, or they're moving across to Dubai to Saudi Arabia where it's tax-free and they have a much better quality of life and they're able to make back the amount that they have lost in the last 10 years. This is why the NHS is collapsing. And the government are now bringing in nurses from countries like Hong Kong, like India, like the Philippines, and they are damaging other healthcare systems. Similarly, how Dubai and how Saudi are damaging our healthcare system, the, our government is doing the exact same. And the solution is, pay the nurses and we wouldn't have this problem if you pay the nurses maybe they'll actually come back maybe you'll have more joining in to university to study now we're joined by es health reporter daniel Keane. dan what do we know about this looming paramedic strike we're in a situation with around 24 hours to go now where we don't quite know specifically whether category two calls which are chest pain, uh, strokes, things like that, are going to be answered. Um, however, I think the best indication we can get is from the London Ambulance Service, which has declared an incident and said, people without a life-threatening condition should make their own way to hospital tomorrow. So, I mean, it's pretty worrying. We don't know the exact specifics of that yet, but I suspect what will be happening is you'll have physicians sort of triaging calls. So they will be listening to a call to try and determine whether it is life-threatening or not. And if they deem it to be not life-threatening, then people will be urged to make their own way to hospital, whether that's sort of in a taxi or in public transport. What are paramedics telling you about the situation on the ground? When you speak to paramedics, the situation on the ground has been pretty terrible for, for quite a long time. So there was actually some leaked data for it from the um, health service journal which showed that the london ambulance service took a mean time of just under two hours to respond to a category two call so i think while tomorrow will obviously be terrible and adding fuel to the fire in some senses the response times for a category two call are already really bad so the data has been been bad for a long time the working conditions have been bad for paramedics for a very long time really personally not surprised that they are taking this industrial action however uh, i think we will need you know, hopefully some, some reassurance for the unions in, in the coming hours that the Category 2 calls will be dealt with. Is there any hope, any light that this impasse can be overcome? Rishi Sunak sees this as kind of existential issue for his government. And it's very clear that Barclay is under instruction to kind of hold firm and, and not negotiate on pay. They feel perhaps that to give in to any of the health unions would mean that other public sector unions would start demanding similar pay rises. And, um, you know, they're not wrong. It, 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 that, that, that could happen. However, there is significant in the polls, a significant difference in public support between uh, you know, some of these NHS strikes and some of the rail strikes. Is there some kind of ideological battle going on here, too? If we look at Scotland, where the Royal College of Nursing has suspended strike action, they are looking at a pay offer of about 7.5%. And I think the union are, are open to that. The fact that they have accepted that in Scotland, I think, is very promising. I think the problem at the moment is that the government won't even open negotiations on pay whatsoever.
There's more on this story in the Evening Standard newspaper and online at standard.co.uk. That's The Leader. We're back on Wednesday at 4pm.